Um, and if you guys have any questions as I'm talking, then just raise your hand. Uh, I want this to be interactive, not just you guys listening to me drone on. And if you can't hear me, um, just let me know. Can you guys see that? That's pretty small. In the back? Good? Okay. Yeah, it can be. It can be. How's that? Okay. Yeah, it's not very sharp, I know. That'll work. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, I think the last thing we talked about, um, or what we didn't get into last time, was the this pointer. So I'll just start by asking um, anybody have any idea what this is going to be inside of here? <laughs> Okay, that's not wrong. Yeah, okay. So the, the short answer is um, you don't know. So you cannot determine based on looking at this what this, that's confusing, can't determine what this is going to be um, in this scenario because this is something, at least in JavaScript, that is defined at runtime, okay? And there's sort of a, four-step rule that you can follow <coughs> to determine what this is going to be and it's all about uh, what's your name John. it's all about what John said it's totally de dependent upon how it's called so actually let's just go over to Chrome so I've got this um, you guys see that oh, not, not much to work with got all these windows okay so um, I'm just going to put a breakpoint right here, and we're going to go through this. All right, first time. So bar, bar is just a function, right? So here I'm just invoking bar. I'm passing in a string and an integer. So can anybody guess what the this keyword is going to be in this scenario? So you're just capital the bar function, okay? So this is where it's kind of weird. Um, it's actually going to be the the window object. So if we actually step through this and hit <coughs> ten. So result one, if I hover over it, it's going to be undefined. So if you guys remember last time we talked about a function that doesn't return anything implicitly, you can imagine that it just has at the very end a return undefined. Okay, so we invoke bar. Bar doesn't return anything, so it's going to return undefined. But if I was to go down over here to the console and do window.foo, it's set to foo bar. So that's something to keep in mind um, about this is that by default, it's going to be the global scope. Okay, so that's sort of your first rule, and that's probably in order. It's the least strong rule, if you will. So if we go back here, the next example is we're calling new. Um, we haven't really talked about the new keyword, so um, I'll kind of, we'll circle back to that. Um, but in this scenario, I'll just go ahead and tell you, if you invoke a new bar, then the this keyword is going to be essentially a new object. So internally, when we're stepping through this, actually let's go back and rerun through that. Step 10, let's step into bar. So this, if I hover over it, you can see it's just a just an empty object really. It's all it is. Um, so the way that works, actually this is a good time. So the new keyword, so one of the confusing things about JavaScript actually is the new keyword because everybody's used to classical inheritance and so they, they think, well, what am I doing? I'm instantiating an object, what, what's going on here? And, and um, you'll notice that, like we talked about earlier, bar's just a function, okay? 
Now, there is a convention in JavaScript that um, things that you intend to call with the new keyword should be capitalized. Okay, but that's not a rule. So I could call any function with the new keyword, and I could, you know, and that could be good or bad depending on the context. So this was written with the intent of being called with the new keyword. Okay, so the first thing that happens when you call new is it's going to spin up an empty object. Okay, and if you guys remember from last time, there's a few ways you can do that. You can call object.create. back on that. So there's a static method. Actually, I'll just go look at what it is. <coughs> That's interesting. I don't know why Chrome's upset with calling object.create. Six, maybe not. So, man, now that goes in. So we're going to talk about prototypes. Um, it does. It wants a prototype, so we can just pass null. Um, so that's one way you can create an object. The other way, the easiest way, the way I recommend, um, is to just do open braces. Right. So var who equals Got a new object. Okay, so the first thing it's going to happen when you call new is it's going to create an empty object. The second thing that's going to happen is it's going to let's get back over here. It's going to set that empty object, and this all happens kind of under the hood. Um, so it's going to set that empty empty object to the this pointer. Okay, and then it's going to execute the body of the function. And then it's going to return that object that it created. Okay, so if you'll notice, so we step through here, 10, go back out here. Result 2, it's not undefined this time. So even though bar doesn't return anything, we got a value back. So it's the fact that we called it with a new keyword that matters. Okay, so that's that's all that's happening with the new keyword. So so don't get confused and try that. Well, it's, there's a class and it must be instantiating an object and all this crazy stuff. It's all it's, it's just a function. Okay, that's all that's going on. And that is actually our our next rule. Actually, we skipped a rule. Um, so as far as determining what the this pointer is going to be, um, so the first rule we talked about is if it's just a function that's invoked then it's going to be the global object okay now if it's called with the dot operator then it's going to be um, whatever the object before the dot was so if I was to call like right here result to dot change foo okay change foo has a this pointer here that's going to be in this scenario, it's going to be result two. And if you if you get confused about the global thing, knowing well when is it global, when is it not? If I just go over here and call, you know, var new foo equals forty two, that's the same thing as uh, doing window dot new foo. So just keep that in mind. You're you're implicitly working in the window object at least in terms of a browser. Node.js, it's going to be a little different. I'm not too familiar with Node.js, but there's a different global object in that scenario. 
So those are our first two scenarios. So those are the easy scenarios, the dot operator. So the third scenario is, was it called with the new keyword? So if the function was invoked with the new keyword, then the this pointer is going to be the new object that was spun up as a result of the new keyword, okay? So the only thing that's gonna trump that is if you use call or apply, okay? And that's kind of weird, so we'll get to that. So let's go through, well, we'll go through this. Result two dot change foo. So step into that, we're gonna go into change foo. You can see this is equal to result two. We could come over here and test that. This triple equals result two is true. So we're setting it equal to the value. Changed foo, okay. So result two, it's foo is changed foo. Now, this is where the, I said the dot call op operator trumps the other rules. So we're calling it, we're calling change foo on result two, just like we did last time. Okay, so you'd think, well, the dot operator result two, that must be, that means that the, this pointer is result two. Well, it's not. So we're not, so the first thing to notice here is we're not invoking change foo at this point in time. Up here, we were invoking it because we are opening it with the open parentheses and passing it a value. You don't have to pass it a value. But really, it's the action of opening it with the parentheses that it's going to interpret that as an invocation of that function. So in this scenario, we're just accessing it as a variable, piece of data which happens to be a function. Um, when we get to the prototypes, it'll make more sense as to why you can call dot call and dot apply on a function when it's represented as a variable like this. But if you take that function and you, and you invoke dot call, then you can pass in what you want the this pointer to be explicitly. Okay, and so this is oftentimes what's happening with a lot of frameworks when it's managing the this pointer for you and the this pointer is magically what you want it to be, like things inside jQuery and whatnot, it's because it, it, the framework's being nice and it's calling it, it's using the call keyword, or excuse me, not the call keyword, the call method to implicitly specify what it's going to be, All right? So empty object, that's empty. After we step over this, F10, empty object, it's foo is now dot call bar. Result two, it's still changed foo. It did not change. Okay, so it's like you can think of it like it's hijacking the this pointer in that scenario. Um, as far as what the difference is between dot call and dot apply, so dot call, um, they both expect the first object to be what you want the this pointer to be. So they're the same in that regard. Um, dot call expects um, a comma separated list of arguments that it's going to pass. So in this scenario, it says call change foo, and it's gonna just read after everything after the first argument and pass it in here. Um, apply expects it as an array. So the only difference would be uh, result to dot change foo dot apply have to pass it like this. Oh, I didn't change anything. And that's really, honestly, the, the when you use one over the other is going to be just a matter of convenience. Sometimes you're dealing with an array. Sometimes you're dealing with... Um, the scenario we're using call is, is easier. And the easiest way to remember it is think of apply starts with A, so it's gonna, it wants an array. Call starts with C, so it wants a comma separated list of arguments. That's how I remember it. Okay, so we talked about the this keyword. Does anybody have any questions about the this keyword? Uh, in the situation where you're using like a constructor Okay. What if bar didn't have an explicit return in it? Does that, like, what it expresses? 
so it is going to um, it's going to hijack um, that that object that got spun up. So basically, that object just like gets thrown, like, thrown away. Or Pretty much, yeah. You don't have any handles anymore. Uh, yeah. So the train gets thrown away, or the or the new object? The new object will. Right. So, so if so we so were. It doesn't really make sense to use this if you're going to return explicitly a return. I've, I've seen I've seen people do it that way, where you build up an object and then you just like return them at the end, or maybe you, the whole body of it's just like a return and then like bracket like braces. Yeah, I mean it. It just it sort of depends on what's going on in there, but. Um, yeah, you're sort of choosing, like, do I want to use the object that was spun up, or do I want to return my own custom-built object, you know? Um, the advantage of, and we haven't gotten to the prototypes, but the advantage of using the spun up object is that um, one of the things that I didn't mention that happens when the new keyword um, is invoked is it takes the prototype of the constructor here, and it sets that to be the, um, it's, it's called, so it's called, in the in the spec, it's called bracket bracket prototype, which is an awful name, and you cannot access that um, in JavaScript. So the way you'll commonly see that, so this is a good segue, so let's go, that's not file, I can find it out. So, where am I? Here, I'm using it here. Um, actually, no, hold on, bear with me. This is what we want to see. Please be visible. Can everybody see that? Okay. So, um, so this is a good segue. So, so as far as the prototypes, um, and right now let's just focus on this right here. Okay, so this is this is part of every JavaScript environment whenever it gets um, spun up essentially. So the circle, uh, circles, excuse me, in this um, diagram are functions and the squares are objects, okay? So every single, um, Easiest way to think of it, so every single function is going to have a, a dot prototype and every single object is going to have a dot constructor. Now by default, they are going to point to each other. So the constructor of, the, of this object here is, is this object function. So in our example over here, So we've got result two. So the other the other property that I was talking about is this um, double underscore proto double underscore, um, which is deprecated. Um, but um, and the way to uh, so the way to pronounce that typically is dunder proto, because everybody hates saying dub underscore underscore double underscore. So that's the way to say it if you're going to be cool in JavaScript. Um, yeah, I like Dunder Mifflin. So, so if I take bar, right, so that was our function that we called new on. I call bar.prototype and then I say triple equals this object that I spun up when I called new Dunder Proto it's the same thing, okay? So that's why you notice whenever we said bar dot prototype and we did dot change foo. Right. So what we were doing was we were setting it to um, by setting it to the op to the to the function's prototype, we were effectively guaranteeing that any time the new keyword was called on bar, that that dunder proto was going to have that, okay? So so here's the big difference though with that is a lot of people think that um, that means that you get a 
that everything has its own copy of it. Okay, and that's that's not the case. So the biggest difference between um, JavaScript and other languages that trips people up is that other languages use classical inheritance. Okay, so classical inheritance, you create a class. It really should have been honestly called class oriented but we can't go back in time and change it. They call it object oriented, so whatever. Um, this is actually probably more um, a better fit for the word. So only in JavaScript can you spin up an object with just by itself. Um, in other languages like class, classical inherit, inherited languages, you have to create a class and then an object is going to be um, stamped out based upon that. So when you create a like a base class, if you have a person and then an employee that inherits from person, whenever you create a new employee, it gets all the attributes of person. So if there's a first name property on person, I've got an example of this. So let's say we've got function employee. and employees I set dunder proto for the employee to the person's prototype when I, when I do a new, when I call new on employee, I don't get first and last and age. That doesn't exist on me, okay? It exists on the prototype. So there's only one instance of it. So that's a key difference. And you might be like, well, what's the difference? What do you do? Well, it's, it's actually a major difference um, because what you're doing in JavaScript is instead of data and behavior inheritance, per se, is you're delegating. The best way to describe it is called behavior delegation. All right, so let's see if I can, so we'll look at number here, all right? So this is the number. So if you go do var, you know, foo equals 42, then you can imagine there's gonna be a little square here that would say foo, and then it's dunder proto would be pointing to this, right? So when I call foo dot too fixed. Um, it's not. It's there's no too fixed on on the foo. Um, it's going. It's going to delegate up the prototype chain. So it's a lot like when if you guys remember the scope, the lexical scoping, how it kind of plays go fish. You know, do you have do you have this variable? <coughs> no. Okay, go to the next one. It's doing the same thing with the prototype chain. So it just delegates mm -hmm. up until it finds it. So that's why you can call to string on everything is because unless you mess with the prototype chain um, because it's on the object functions prototype so it's accessible to everything so some important things with this that's really it's really confusing um, it confuses me even all the time is the way that the function um, function and its prototype relate with the object function and its prototype. So if you can think this here, we just we specified that the circle um, represents a function. Well, what is the, the prototype um, or the dunder proto, the bracket bracket prototype of of a function here is well it's it's the it's the function object that is the prototype of function so it gets totally confusing and even saying it out loud now it's even more confusing um, but you kind of get this circular reference here and that's that's just because um, functions are essentially functions are first class citizens in JavaScript so you can represent them um, just like you would an integer or, an, or excuse me a number or a string or anything else um, let's see we talked about so apply and call. So the reason you can call dot apply and dot call on anything that's a function is because they're available on the uh, function prototype, right? So that's that behavior delegation. We call dot cha or change foo dot call. There's no call on change foo. 
doesn't exist. So it delegated up. Well, what am I? I'm a function. Okay, so I was constructed by this function. Well, what's that prototype? Okay, oh, it's a, the function dot prototype. Oh, look, it's got a call method. So that's how it's going to trace that up. Um, you do have to be careful with the constructor um, because it will, by default, um, you know, like in the example of creating a new number and setting it to 42, um, foo, its constructor is going to point over to this number function, but it's there's scenarios where it breaks easily, so you kind of have to be careful trying to use the constructor to get back to the to the prototype. The reason that's an issue is because um, in the past, oops, that's what I want. In the past, there was no way to get from an instance of employee, for example. So if I wanted to know what the Dunder Proto is, there was no, there was no Dunder Proto. So Dunder Proto came about because people were like, hey, we need a way to access this bracket bracket prototype thing that's in the spec. And you couldn't. So the vendors created the Dunder Proto, everybody except JavaScript basic, or JavaScript IE did. <laughs> um, so, and then there is also, So let's see here. Object. There is a git prototype of. So I could pass in result to, and I'm going to get that bar object. <coughs> Keep in mind this is this is an object here, right? This is not this is not the function bar that we declared over there. This is an object. And it's kind of weird. You think, well, where did that come from? I didn't create it. Well, every function by default is going to have that. So even if you're, you know, writing, you know, really simple, you know, get my get DOM elements, you know, something, and I'm changing the background color when they click on it or something like that, you know, nothing that you would even remotely think of is for. Um, you know, design like this, there is a git dom elements dot prototype, and that and it's an object that was created. So you, you can do that across the board. Um, it just comes with the language. It unfortunately though, um, it's really powerful using the prototypes um, like we used over here setting. Uh, so, so actually this is a perfect example. So we have the person we want to create a getter for full name. We set it on the prototype and every new person, if I were to call me dot full name, it's going to be equal to just like that. Does anybody have any questions about prototypes? It's now that I've verbalized it, it's uh, a little more confusing. So I think what I'd rather do is um, ask you guys if you have any questions, and then see if I can answer it that way. You said Dunder Proto was deprecated. So is it Git prototype that should be used, or what? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do it. So there is the constructor.prototype, which you have to be careful with, but it will work. Um, Dunder proto and git prototype of. Um, there's nothing wrong with using Dunder proto, um, but it's, it, it, it is part of the spec now, I think, as of like ES4 or 5. I think 5. There was no ES4, I don't think. Um, they skipped one. I can't remember which one. But so there's nothing to, like your code's not going to break, um, but eventually, you know, it's it will complain at you. Some browsers or like actually, I noticed in Plunker over here, I was using uh, Dunder Proto, and it gives me a little warning, and it's like, whoa, you can't use Dunder Proto; it's deprecated. But it works just fine. Um, I believe this is the recommended way to 
get access to that. Thanks. Yes. Uh, on that, the get the what is the get full name example you had before for the term name. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It is so. Um, you know what? Let me pull that up. I've got it. Yeah, so it caught me too. That's an ES6 thing. The getters and setters have been added okay. to ES6. <clears throat> It, it, it is. It's a lot like uh, properties in C-sharp. <coughs> I thought I had an example. I don't believe I do, though, where we used it last time. <coughs> I don't. I don't know where it is. Um, so I kind of tried to leave time this time to, to find out like what you guys would like to hear about. Um, I know somebody mentioned promises, um, one at one point in time. So instead of just me yammering about stuff, does anybody have any questions or anything that they're curious about in JavaScript? And I will try my best to answer it. So I just have a general question. Uh, so there's a lot of features that come out of ES6, but not all browsers support it. So how do you, you know, is there a way to say only if ES6 is supported or like a fallback gracefully, or is it just you don't, if you know you have browsers that don't support it, don't use it? There are, what you can use, um, Probably the recommended thing is to use something called the transpiler, and it basically lets you write your code um, in ES6 and use the latest stuff. And then what it's going to do is it's going to convert everything down to um, what's going to work on all the browsers. Um, as far as determining, um, I think Tim's told me there's a site caniuse.com that that specifies that. Um, but a great example, like Google's transpiler here, um, for the let keyword, the way that it allows you to use the let keyword, if anybody's not familiar, so the let keyword um, is a way to break that function scoping that you normally have and provide block scoping like you do in other languages. Um, so instead of doing var, you can use let. And it's not going to, the word kind of hoist, it's, it's not, it's kind of a weird word, but it's not going to pull those up to the top of the function. It's going to allow it to stay within that block. So if it was inside of an if block, it's only going to exist inside that if block. Well, you can't do let in, unless something supports ES6. So the way that the Google transpiler actually gets around this is it does this, which is really interesting to me. And um, I believe why is it not letting me catch? And then it puts your code in here, and it does it a little more intelligently. But um, and that's because the catch is the one place with. Um, the catch is the one place in pre-ES6 that was block scoped. So it was like this special little scenario where you did get block scoping. So the transpiler essentially replaces your let keywords with um, this. So um, it's not as, so for, at least from my understanding, it's not as easy as far as like supporting ES6 um, with everything um, like you would with like a shim because there are keywords. So as far as the keywords go, like it has to replace, it has to transpile those into something that will work. But some of the things, um, like properties and things that were added to uh, base objects, like I think they had a bunch of new stuff to it, like array. So you could try to polyfill those, or shim, or I don't know 
win the correct shim versus polyfill, but um, Tim would probably know that. One of the best things you can use, at least one of the more popular ones, is uh, Babel. Babel? Yep. Um, and it's they're keeping on top of the latest yearly releases of JavaScript. Um, and you can write in VS 2015, 2016, and it will compile it out. To, uh, so you can see the list down there in the green check marks of the things it supports. Oh, cool. The idea is that when eventually everybody supports it, you don't have to use that. Right. Yeah, actually, um, you got a couple minutes. So one of the things that they added, which I was kind of upset about, to be honest, is the class keyword, because it's not a classical inheritance language. Um, so they like further push people down the road of like, oh yeah, use it like a classical inheritance language. Um, when it's really, actually, it's really powerful as a prototypical language. As a matter of fact, you can mimic a classical style language in programming with a prototypical language like JavaScript, but you can't mimic prototypes and prototypical languages very well with the classical. So it's really more broad, more powerful. Um, but it's it's weird. It's it's counter to what we're taught. Um, so I understand why they added the class keyword. It basically is syntactic sugar around um, all of that uh, creating the, the new, you know, writing a function, capitalizing it, making it be called with the new keyword. Um, it allows you to put class before it. So and specify an actual constructor in there where you're putting the initialization and whatnot. Actually, what's that site? <coughs> That's not it. Oh, I can't remember my own recommendation. There's a fantastic site. This, I think this is it. Yes. Um, so this is a great site. It shows you what they added. So you can look at all the things they added and it shows you how you can do it, how you would do it in ES6. And then it shows you what you would have had to do in ES5 to achieve that, which is really cool. Um, and it's pretty amazing some of the things you look at it and you're like, wow. So <coughs> the class, for example, here, You can see it's it's much easier to understand. You know, someone who isn't as familiar with JavaScript, when they run across this code, they're going to be like, "What is that?" But this, you can make sense out of. But then it's like you said, you're going to see that, and you're going to make all these assumptions about the way the language works. Yeah. Whereas the bottom one might cause you to at least do some research. You're right. Figure out your own. Yeah, it's sort of a. <laughs> They're the, the really, the specs really nudging people towards more C sharpish, you know, traditional object oriented um, style. Um, they added. Where's that? Oh, okay. oh, this is, oh, there's lambdas. Yes, they added what they call them arrow functions, but they're essentially just lambda expressions. Which is nice. Added, I'm trying to think of some of the other really powerful ones. I believe they added a um, bunch of new, yeah. They added like new data structures for representing um, things. So you actually have like maps and sets and promises. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions about stuff we talked about last time? Because we kind of at the very end started going into like closures and scope and a bunch of crazy stuff, and then we just ended. So I don't mind delving back into that too. Nobody. Counting on you. Counting on you. 
All right. So, if you write code in um, assuming script six, and then you use these compilers to compile it down to say five equivalent, are all of your users seeing that um, transcribed code, or are the, the, the is are there ways to send the old browsers to that code and then the newer browsers to the the six code? Like, how do you guys you put that in production? Or maybe that's not a production worthy thing, I don't know. <laughs> so, understand what you're talking about? Is that like a managed pipeline that yeah. serves up dynamically based right. on the right. Based on the agent. Mm -hmm. How do you guys handle that? Or do, does everyone just see the, um, the translated code? So, from my understanding, um, it's going to be, your, yeah, you're just going to push it, you're going to distribute the ES5 code. Got it. Um, I, there may be frameworks, sort of like Less and SAS do for CSS, that sort of, I guess they'd have to keep up with, with everything and detect the features and um, so, but. I guess ultimately, wh who cares, right? Like, I mean, well, I unless there's a performance. You've got a performance hit. Yeah. Right, I'm issue. assuming that the goal is write it in six and eventually post it in six. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have your six, uh, I've never used Babel, but I assume that you are writing uh, pure JavaScript, so right. it's there. It's not like it's going anywhere. Sure. But yeah, I can see a performance. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like TypeScript, um, where you're writing in a different language, right. you know, a meta meta language, <coughs> if you will, and then right. it's turning it into JavaScript. It's It's JavaScript, it's just not. Browsers don't support it yet. So, that's pretty, pretty oh, so are we in the TypeScript and CopyScript now? What's going on here? <laughs> Again. <laughs> um, I've used TypeScript on a project, <laughs> right, Jason? Yeah. What you use it in? Um, the only reason I know mostly about TypeScript is from uh, Angular 2 stuff. So I know Angular 2. Is written in TypeScript, or is, is in TypeScript, really, right? It's written in TypeScript, yeah. Yeah. So, for anybody who's not familiar with TypeScript, um, which which ES six is kind of gonna fix some of the. Is there any examples? Oh, it's gonna take forever. So it it lets you write. Um, so you can see there's a class keyword. Um, and it lets you actually write sort of strongly typed JavaScript. Um, so you know if you say that this, if you say that this function takes in an integer, then it's not going to let you pass in a string. Um, so it, we used it with um, something where we had like really complex um, client side structures that we were dealing with. And and to be honest, um, the appeal from it was was for me. Um, was because I was still comfortable with classical inheritance. Um, and so, I, in my personal opinion, what I've found as far as using TypeScript, TypeScript's a really great product, um, you know, and, and if it helps you, then use it. Uh, but for me, it takes away from the features that I want to have when I'm coding with JavaScript. You know, every now and then I'd run into a scenario in TypeScript where it was enforcing that strongly typed scenario whenever I knew, like, no, I need to, I know what I'm doing, I want to pass this, um, and that's sort of the, the dynamic nature of JavaScript that it's taking away, um, so, which is part of JavaScript's power. So. Is there any, like, interoperability uh, between TypeScript and JavaScript? Exactly. So, so all TypeScript does... <laughs> sorry, sorry, what was that is last? Is one, like, a superset of the other? Or? Yeah, so, so it's... It's sort of it is very similar to the transpiler concept okay. in the sense that, but the difference is, you're writing so TypeScript you're writing in a language that a browser would not understand, sure. so it converts it into JavaScript. Whereas the ES6 transpilers, you're writing in newer version JavaScript and converting to older version JavaScript. So it's not a matter of it's not the language; it's just it's there's newer features. I was just wondering if you could like do like ninety percent of your stuff in TypeScript. 
Oh yeah. Could you pretty easily just like do JavaScript that part and it plays well with each other? Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, it's, and um, it is a it, so it is a superset in that in that sense. Okay. You know, you can yeah. just, just start banging like out JavaScript. Yeah. I think that's the difference between uh, copying scripts and like writing your own code. Yeah. 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 Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, it sounds like it's not really supported today. But. Yeah, to be honest, I'd have to check the uh, can I the can I use. Um, they've gotten they've gotten a lot better lately. Um, I feel like last time I, you know, time before that, anyways, I looked, it was like nothing was supported. So, oh, this has CSS and everything. I thought the, uh, the ES6 page had uh, browser support. Oh, the ES6 features? Maybe something. Maybe that'll be PA. There's a massive breakdown somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to yeah. dig it up. <laughs> Is that a Wikipedia? No. Uh, <laughs> colors. Terrible mm -hmm. I think it's like, it's I think a lot it's of colors. Like Chrome looks really good, and then a lot of other browsers. Not so much. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I up to 11 terrible, Edge starts to open it up, Edge 13 starting to look pretty good. Edge 13? Yeah, I think they skipped one. Like, skipping a bunch of others. Windows 10 is especially. They were skipping a bunch of others. They were starting to get the Xbox One. Thanks, Austin. Thank you.